If one sought to summarize the life of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam in just one word, what would it be? My proposition is that the one word that encapsulates his life best is thabat, which translates to immovability or steadfastness. You see, it's not just the number of tests that he labored against, which is amazing, but the sheer diversity of these tests as well. The Prophet ﷺ faced trials and tests in the political, physical, financial, familial, moral and ideological spheres. Yet in the face of each tribulation, his position was the same, immovable thabat. He was hounded by torture. The initial reaction of the Meccan pagan community towards the newly born mission of the Prophet ﷺ was persecution. This hostility was even found among his own family members as the Prophet ﷺ suffered at the hands of his uncle and neighbor Abu Lahab. Furthermore, Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt smothered the neck and back of the Prophet ﷺ as he prostrated to his Lord with the intestines of a camel rendering him motionless on the ground. The Prophet ﷺ would have have remained in the state had it not been for his daughter Fatima who rushed to remove the filth from him. Meanwhile, the pagans watched on hysterically laughing at him. On another occasion, Uqba choked the Prophet Muhammad from behind during his prayer. Others would mock his claims of there being a resurrection by blowing depleted bones into his blessed face and loudly asking, Allah will revive this? A summary, however, of his stance during this phase of persecution can be captured by one word and that word is Thabat. He was also hounded by family after physical pressure proved ineffective in breaking the resolve of the Prophet ﷺ, the pagans employed a new pressuring technique, lobbying members of his family against him. They approached the Prophet's uncle Abu Talib who, despite being a pagan, was a staunch supporter of the Prophet ﷺ. They wanted Abu Talib to exert pressure on his nephew and put an end to his mission. On one occasion, it seemed that Abu Talib's resolve had weakened and there were indications that he may intend to abandon his nephew and the Prophet ﷺ sensed this potential isolation. Despite being all alone, the Prophet ﷺ gave a stunning response which would be eternalized in the books of history. He said to his uncle, O oh uncle, I swear that if they were to place the sun in my right hand and the moon in my left hand in return for me to walk away from my mission, I will not do so. I will persist till this religion prevails or I die in the process and he then wept. This second phase of tribulation can be once again captured by one word, immovable thabat. He was also hounded by worldly incentives. After failing in their second approach, the pagans considered yet a third technique, one that continues to bring the most principled of people to their knees. It is none other than the offering of worldly temptations. All positions of authority were offered to the Prophet ﷺ, including kingship, unlimited amounts of wealth, and the finest of women from Quraysh. All that was sought in return was for the Prophet ﷺ to end his mission. During one such negotiation, the Prophet ﷺ did not interrupt the ambassador of Mecca. The Prophet waited for the ambassador to completely finish his pitch and then politely asked, have you finished? Utbah then said yes. And at this point, the Prophet ﷺ said to him, so listen to me now. And he merely recited verses from the Quran, all of which were from Surah Fussilat, till he reached the following verse where Allah said, فَإِنْ أَعْرَضُوا فَقُلْ أَنْذَرْتُكُمْ صَاعِقَةً مِثْلَ صَاعِقَةِ عَادٍ وَثَمُودٍ But if they turn away, then say to them, I have warned you of a thunderbolt like the thunderbolt that struck Ad and Thamud. And it was as if an actual thunderbolt had struck the ambassador's heart as he heard this he pleaded with the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to stop reciting and he swiftly returned to his community urging them to let the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam continue upon his mission what word would best summarize this phase of trials in the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's life undoubtedly it would be thabat yet again he was also hounded by religious pressure. The pagans decided to present yet another offer to the Prophet ﷺ. They would embrace Islam on the condition that he worshipped their idols for a year and they would worship Allah for the following year. But in response to this, Allah revealed Surah Al-Kafirun قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ لَا أَعْبُدُ مَا تَعْبُدُونَ Which the Prophet ﷺ recited publicly to the pagans. And this caused them to realize that this option would be rejected as well. They then insinuated that they would believe 
believe should he create a special exclusive gathering for them to the direct exclusion of the poor people of Mecca. Again, he rejected this request in compliance with Allah's instruction. Do not send away those who call upon their Lord in the morning and afternoon seeking his face. So what single word can be used to describe this phase in the Prophet's life? Undoubtedly that word is Thabat. He was also hounded by defamation. Next, in their arsenal was mockery, where they would use dismissive labels against the Prophet ﷺ. They called him a liar, magician, madman, soothsayer, a poet. They played with the letters of his name, changing it from Muhammad, meaning the praised one, to Mudhammam, meaning the reviled one. They altered the greeting of peace from Assalamu Alaikum, peace be upon you, to Assalamu Alaikum, meaning death be upon you. Nothing can be more demoralizing than satire and belittlement. Yet despite all of this, the Prophet ﷺ remained unfazed and his hallmark during this phase was yet again Thabat. He was also hounded by the rage of war. Following his migration to Medina, Allah gave permission to the believers to partake in jihad in defense of their lives. But the theme of Thabat in the Prophet's life simply did not change. Think about his behavior during the Battle of Badr. Ali gave the following vivid testimony. He said, I remember how we were on the day of Badr, Ali said, drawing near to the Prophet ﷺ. And he was the closest one to the lines of the enemies. And he was the bravest warrior on that day. His political life therefore again is best abridged in one encompassing word and that is Thabat. He was also hounded by death. The Prophet ﷺ witnessed numerous tragedies throughout his life. He buried his wife Khadija, his first and greatest love. Likewise, his eyes fell on the mutilated corpse of his uncle Hamza, following a devastating loss in the battlefield. Furthermore, he had to witness the death of almost every one of his children, and he bore the stress of seeing the corpses of his loyal companions scattered across the battlefield in defense of his own blessed life. How much trauma can one bear? Nevertheless, he weathered it all in a breathtaking display of Thabat. Now, how does all of this relate to us? Unbeknown to most, the test for Thabat, steadfastness, in the life of a Muslim is a daily occurrence. In fact, you might be subject to a test regarding it during every hour of your life, regardless of whether you are at home or behind the desk, in the public sphere or private quarters, the test is active and the eyes of Allah the Divine are on you. You may find yourself being called to prayer for the fifth time during the day and you feel that your body or your soul or both are on the verge of letting you down. But you pull yourself together in the display of mighty thabat before Allah. When your carnal desires peak, your hormones rage and sinful opportunities for relief are but a click away. You still are able to maintain control over yourself and you realize that I am at the heart of a burning test, one that Allah will help me extinguish with thabat, steadfastness. You may come across a damaging but popular shubha, doubt, which seeks to undermine the fundamental of the religion or the character of the Prophet ﷺ. This dangerous illusion may cause people to drop like flies all around you, but you however remain braced and you cling on to your faith. You realize that this is yet another test as you exhibit impressive thabat. When a distressing ordeal befalls you and separates you from something that you loved, you veer away from the dark paths of despair. Despite the tears and anguish you may experience, at the end of the day you find your way in a path of thabat. When those around you abdicate their Islamic dress and descend from their lofty thrones of hijab and haya modesty, you on the other hand see it as an opportunity to represent the prophetic way during these times of estrangement. You realize that the reward is now aggrandized and therefore you hold on to your hijab with unconquerable thabat. When it is the time to plan your wedding and family pressure for a concert light setting begins to mount, you display what no man could ever scale. You firmly manifest thabat like a mountain and you act upon what you know will serve you best in the hereafter during that happy occasion of your marriage. It is easy to put a case for Thabat in abstract terms, but living by it is another tale. Thankfully, alhamdulillah, the stores of Thabat are available for its seekers and I offer three bits of advice. 
Number one, for those who wish to foster their thabat, a conscious and intentional retreat to the Quran is required. If approached with understanding, contemplation, and application, this method of fostering thabat is unmatched. In fact, according to Allah, this is one of the primary purposes of the Quran's revelation. Allah said, قُلْ نَزَّلَهُ رُوحُ الْقُدُسِ مِنْ رَبِّكَ بِالْحَقِّ Say, the Holy Spirit, Jibreel, has brought down the Quran from your Lord with the truth. لِيُثَبِّتَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا To strengthen the believers. To give thabat wahuda and as a guide. وَبُشْرَى للمسلمين And good news for the Muslims. Number two, the remembrance of Allah. It is amazing that the verse which orders us to have thabat on the battlefield also instructs us to remember Allah abundantly. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, o you who believe. Ida laqeetum fi'a, when you face an enemy, fathbutu, have thabat, stand firm. And then Allah said, وَذْكُرُوا اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ And remember Allah much so that you may triumph. So if the remembrance of Allah helps a person during the rage of war, what then of its effects on our day-to-day -day battles that are far less intense? In order to activate this source of thabat, I suggest the following routine. Start by setting a reoccurring alarm for the morning and evening remembrances, and then print out a comprehensive list of post-prayer remembrances. Implementing just these two effectively sets you up nicely for more. And finally, number three, you get what you ask for. One thing that all Muslims of exemplary thabat have in common is that they ask Allah Almighty for this faculty. The army of Prophet Dawood, which defeated Jalut and his men, they appealed to Allah for thabat just before war. And they said, Rabbana afriq alayna sabara. Our Lord, pour upon us patience. Wa thabbit aqdamana and brace our feet. Give thabat to our feet. Wansurna ala al qawm al kafirin and grant us victory over the disbelieving people. And against all odds, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them victory and their prayers were answered. And as a further suggestion, I recommend that you memorize the dua of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who would appeal to his Lord by saying, Allahumma inni as'aluka thabata fil amri wal azimata ala rushdi O Allah, I ask you for thabat in all my affairs and determination in following the right path. In short, there are two bridges that every Muslim must cross over. An earthly bridge, that is the bridge of Islam, and an unearthly one, and that is the Sirat, the bridge of the hereafter. And a person's thabat on the former will determine his thabat on the latter. And therefore the mindset of a Muslim is an unconquerable one. And his identity is always impregnable. And should a single word define him or her, that word would be thabat. <laughs>